Welcome to Control 22. I'm Rick Norgate, Managing Director of Predator, and I'm delighted you've all chosen to join us today for this live stream. Um, today we've got a variety of industry experts and some really great speakers that are going to be talking to you about cyber resilience and giving you practical advice on the things that you can do to help boost your company's cyber resiliency in the scope of all your data backup and recovery. Now at Predator we believe in five fundamentals. There are five key things that every business needs to do to be cyber secure. Throughout today's session we've got five very short, very entertaining videos that highlight those five fundamentals. See if you can spot them. Now I'm in York Road um, at IBM's uh, London headquarters today in their lovely innovation centre. This was meant to be a physical event but due to train strikes we've had to switch to virtual at the last moment. Um, so I am actually in the venue myself. If you want to, maybe we can pan that camera around and show the uh, packed audience that we're presenting to. Hi Ben. So you will be my interactive audience of one. So as I say, I'm here at York Road at the Innovation Centre. Now if this had been a physical event, you would have all been here today. And what's great about this place is they've got some amazing um, experiences that you can actually partake in. Clearly we can't do that today. So what I think we'll do, if we can, I'm going to cut to this camera. We're going to go on a little sneak peek and we'll have a little tour around the Innovation Centre and I'll show you some of the cool exhibits. So, want to watch the step and come this way? Well, uh, hopefully, get to see a few of the little exhibits that we've got. Okay, so first up here, we've got Spot, the robotic dog. So Spot um, is used for a variety of use cases, everything from bomb disposal, whereas at IBM in this building, Spot's actually put to use. They use Spot for everything from keeping an eye on temperature, they use them to walk around and monitor fire extinguishers and the plant room here. For example, if they need to go and do maintenance in their plant room and have to close that down, that costs money. It takes time to close down before a human can go in. They can send spot in with his cameras through the analysis, understand if any maintenance needs to be done without shutting the plant down, again, saving time and money. So really a good use case of AI and uh, machine learning in spot the dog. Weather station here. Uh, this is all linked to, the, I don't know if you can see out there with the camera, just over out the window. Um, that's London out there, which is actually looking nice and sunny for once, which is great. They've got live weather station out there feeding into this data bank here. And then this is linked into national weather systems, updating weather every 15 minutes compared to the national weather, which generally updates every four hours. So really accurate weather based on the various weather stations that IBM have. Come down this way, show you a little bit more if we can. This room might be dark, it is, but hopefully your camera can see. This is an experience room where they have projectors on the roof and they can project onto all the walls in 3D and it's basically, you can be in an interactive video. I think the video at the moment that they have is of the IBM Mayflower, which is the sustainable ship that they've got autonomously sailing around the world collecting data, showcasing IBM tech. Come down this way, I'll, I'll speed up a bit, like Martin Brundle's grid walk, or for older people in the audience, challenge Annika. Um, here we've got a device called Proto. So this is a 3D cube that uses projection in 3D. That's actually a great example there with the IBM logo. What you can do with this is using webcams on your laptop, it can take you as a 2D image, present you as a 3D image, and then you can use this in meetings for people to meet virtually in more of a 3D space than just talking to a flat 2D picture on a webcam. So a really clever piece of kit. Come down this way. Let's go down the corridor. One more thing I'd like to show you. So this is a, obviously a new innovation centre that's uh, been opened in the last few months. A, a really, really lovely place. Um, the final thing I want to show you, we just go past the trolley there. And I always want to talk quietly in here, but I don't need to. This is the IBM quantum computing room. And as you can see here, we can point the camera at that. We've got one of IBM's quantum computers. And we are going to hear from Adam, as I said before, who's going to talk to us about quantum computing and what that means in the fight against cybercrime. So I think that's it for the tour. Um, enjoy today's Control 22. <laughs>
Khái niệm mẹ hóa rất đơn giản nhưng mạnh mẽ. Về cơ bản, mẹ hóa là quá trình thay đổi các tệp kỹ thuật số. Từ một ngôn ngữ có thể hiểu được sang một ngôn ngữ hoàn toàn xa lạ. Hãy tưởng tượng, nếu tôi lấy một tập lệnh về thay đổi các từ sang một ngôn ngữ mà bạn không biết, trừ khi bạn có cách để dịch nó, nếu không, nội dung sẽ vô nghĩa đối với bạn. Tôi có thể cho bạn biết ngày sinh của tôi, tên thời con gái của mẹ tôi, tên con vật cưng đầu tiên của tôi hoặc số an ninh xã hội của tôi, nhưng bạn sẽ không biết. Trừ khi bạn có phương tiện để giải mẹ nó, để chuyển nó trở lại ngôn ngữ mà bạn hiểu, thì điều đó sẽ vô ích. Bạn cần một thông dịch viên, hoặc Google dịch, hoặc một từ điển song ngữ trước khi bạn có thể đọc được dữ liệu đó. Khái niệm mẹ hóa rất đơn giản nhưng mạnh mẽ. Về cơ bản, mẹ hóa là quá trình thay đổi các tệp kỹ thuật số. Từ một ngôn ngữ có thể hiểu được sang một ngôn ngữ hoàn toàn xa lạ. Hãy tưởng tượng, nếu tôi lấy một tập lệnh về thay đổi các từ sang một ngôn ngữ mà bạn không biết, trừ khi bạn có cách để dịch nó, nếu không, nội dung sẽ vô nghĩa đối với bạn. Tôi có thể cho bạn biết ngày sinh của tôi. Tên thời con gái của mẹ tôi, tên con vật cưng đầu tiên của tôi hoặc số an ninh xã hội của tôi, nhưng bạn sẽ không biết. Trừ khi bạn có phương tiện để giải mẹ nó, để chuyển nó trở lại ngôn ngữ mà bạn hiểu, thì điều đó sẽ vô ích. Bạn cần một thông dịch viên, hoặc Google dịch, hoặc một từ điển song ngữ trước khi bạn có thể đọc được dữ liệu đó. With about 7,000 languages spoken in the world today, It wouldn't have been impossible to find the right key to decode my message. But with 256-bit encryption, there are literally billions of possibilities. It would take today's computers thousands of years to break the code. Professor Nibbles So we've already had a little sneak peek at the quantum computing room. We did an ad hoc walk around at the start of the conference. I'm now going to pass over to IBM's um, quantum computing guru, Adam Hammond, who's going to talk to us about the future of cybercrime and how quantum computing has a role to play within that. It's a session I'm really excited for. Um, I think it's a real eye opener. So coming to us from the room next door, Adam, over to you. Hi, my name's Adam Hammond and I work within the quantum team here at IBM. You've just heard from Tone in the video that you saw before me the importance that encryption plays in protecting your data. And cryptography is the science behind encryption. And our digital world depends on cryptography and encryption to keep it safe whether that be online banking, online shopping, exchanging of credit card information, using your digital identities in order to be able to prove who you are to online systems. Now, we know in today's current computer environment that there are a set of problems that we know how to solve with today's computers. We also know that there are a whole set of problems out there that we can't solve with today's computers. And cracking encryption is one of those problems that we cannot solve today with today's classical computers. But the latest emerging technology that we're seeing is the science and technology around quantum computing. And the purpose of quantum computing is to give us a different way of attacking some of the problems that we can't solve today, or even attacking some of the problems that we can solve, but finding better ways of solving those problems. Examples could include, can we find ways of simulating molecules so that we understand exactly how they're going to react with different molecules? 
can we find materials that have properties that we would like to see, whether that be extreme resilience, whether that be being waterproof, whether that be the way they interact or don't interact with other materials. Can we simulate those and actually create those? Can we find better ways of doing machine learning? There's already growing evidence that using quantum computing to build machine learning data models brings us greater insight. And there are a whole series of problems around optimization in things like um, costing financial instruments, network optimization, routing optimization, where we think that quantum computing will be able to give us better answers, more accurate answers than classical computing today. And this is all down to the fact that what quantum computers allow us to do is to simulate quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics are how the world works at a molecular and atomic level. And up until now, all we've been able to do is very, very roughly approximate the way that the world works. With quantum computers, we'll be able to simulate the way that the world works much more accurately and that will give us the opportunity to solve problems that are much more real world than we've been able to do up to now. The other thing that quantum computers allows us to do is it allows us to solve some really complicated mathematical problems much more easily. And one of those problems is the mathematical problem of factoring very, very large numbers. Let me give you an example. Today, if we wanted to find the prime factors of a 2048-bit integer, so two numbers, or a series of two, set of two numbers, the compute time to do that with the most powerful computer today is estimated to be millions of years. Now, why is this important? This is important because this is what sits behind the way that today's cryptography works. Today's safe cryptography relies on the fact that we use exceptionally big numbers that today's computers can't factorise in order to create our public keys without being able to factorise, which would give us what the private keys are associated with those public keys. So today, we know that it would take millions of years to be able to crack a 2048-bit number, which means that the cryptography we're using is safe today. But with the advent of scalable quantum computers, we believe that using an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, this task becomes a matter of hours. What this means is today's cryptography will be cracked at some point in the future by the upcoming quantum computing technology. So where you've got public key encryption, where you've got digital signatures that rely on public keys and private keys, where you're exchanging these keys, we know that those schemas that are listed on the slide will be cracked by Shor's algorithm, potentially in a matter of hours. There's also another class of cryptography that we use, typically symmetric, where you're sharing, where you're hashing, um, where you're doing password derivation, that we know that a different algorithm will mean that they have to be improved. So they won't cr we won't crack that, but it means that you will have to use larger key lengths, larger digest lengths. Now, the reality is we don't have a scalable, fault-tolerant quantum computer today. So why is this a problem today? So let's look at the data that potentially is encrypted today. So, first of all, let's look at our infrastructure. Um, simplest bit of infrastructure, if you think about our passports, our passports all have a digital identity for us, encrypted on a chip in the passport. We carry it round with us. Our passports generally are valid for 10 years. We'll be carrying that passport round with us for 10 years. 
Software in cars. How long does a car last? 15 years, 25 years? Trains, planes, probably longer, 25 years, 35 years. Um, and actually, we know that there are some mainframe applications that have been running for the last 50 years. But that's just the infrastructure. Let's look at the validity of the data that we may be encrypting today. You know, if you look at health data, the HIPAA Act in the US says five years. Tax records, we know in the UK that we have to keep tax records for seven years. If you're doing clinical trials, that data has to be kept safe for 25 years. And in Japan, medical records have to be kept secure for 100 years. So where does that sit in terms of where we think we're going with quantum computers and potentially the ability to decrypt, to crack that data? So if we go to the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US who are driving all of the uh, focus around quantum safe cryptography, their view is that it may be possible to break the current RSA key approach by 2030. That's less than 10 years away. If you talk to the Institute of Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo, who are very focused on this and a leading research organisation in quantum computing, um, as you will see, um, by 2026 they think there's a one in seven chance. That's uh, less than four years away. And they reckon there's a 50% chance in less than 10 years. Gartner has a different view on the importance of doing this. And that is that what they found is that organisations that have taken this seriously and that are putting in place measures to become quantum safe are actually becoming safer overall. And they're 60% less likely to have security break-ins based around cryptographic issues, i.e. someone's cracked into their cryptography. So the reality is there is data out there today in all of your organisations which will still be valid and important and need to kept, be kept secure within the timescales when there will be hardware, probably, to be able to crack it. What that means is that a bad actor could steal data from you today and while they may not be able to do anything with it today, at some point in the future, at some point within the lifetime when the data that they've stolen is still valid, they will be able to do something with it. So what does that actually mean? What that means is Clearly there's a loss of data confidentiality, clearly there's the ability at some point in the future, if they steal data from you today, that they will be able to read that data, they will be able to access the confidential information that you're storing in that data. But don't forget that this cryptography is used in other areas. It's used to define who you are, it's used in digital identities. So at some point in the future, it may be that somebody approaches and tries to get into a system using a digital identity that still looks absolutely valid, but because they've managed to crack the cryptography behind that digital identity, they're not who they say they are. We're also seeing increasing uses of digital signatures to prove that documents are valid, to maintain legal histories, and you can imagine at some point in the future those digital signatures may not provide the assurance that we think that they do today. And that's why it's really important to think about this today before it becomes an issue in the future. Because data that people take today will be crackable in the future. Now, is there an answer? The answer is yes, there is. And for those of you that are interested in um, this subject area, you may have seen that NIST in the US published the finalists of a competition that they've been running since 2015 to find cryptographic algorithms that will um, still be secure in the face of both conventional and quantum computing. Um, and there are four finalists. Um, I'm delighted that IBM submitted um, three of the finalists. Um, and while these 
move on the route to become standards, um, these are the recommended approaches to become quantum safe. These algorithms will not be crackable. They're designed in a way that they're not crackable by a quantum computer. And IBM's been on this route since 2016. We submitted these algorithms to NIST in 2016, but we haven't been sitting there doing nothing since then. In 2019, we announced our quantum safe tape units using one of the algorithm that's the final, dilithium. Um, we have put quantum secure algorithms on the cloud and made them available to all of our customers. And of course, with the announcement of the Z16 mainframe this year, we have built in hardware encryption based around the quantum safe algorithms. Does this mean that if you run your software on the Z16 that you're safe? No, of course it doesn't, because that's just one element of the architecture. The data moves around. So it's really important to be quantum safe that you understand the use of cryptography within your architecture, within your organization. You have to understand the threat. You have to understand what the potential attack vectors are. And you need to understand the risk. If you've got data in your environment that you know will be worthless in five years' time, probably not worth worrying about it. If you've got data that you know will still be valid and still have value in 15 years' time, well, that's a good example of where you might want to do something. If you've got a system that you're de going to decommission in five years, again, maybe you don't want to think about that. But if you're investing in an infrastructure transformation that's going to last you the next 10 years, then quite possibly you do want to think about how you do that in a way that is quantum safe. I think what we all know is that we don't know what the, th the threats that have not yet happened are going to be like. So it's not just a matter of redesigning it for a one-off threat like, for example, we may have done in, for Y2K. We know that these cryptographic algorithms are going to get broken. We know that they may not be as safe as we think they are. We may know that some of the implementations might have bugs in them. And therefore, what we also have to be able to do is we have to be agile in the way that we deploy crypto into our environments, in the same way that we're agile in the way that we deploy software into our environments using DevOps. So crypto agility is a really important part of how we actually move forward. And then, of course, having crypto agility and understanding what the algorithms and the risks are are all very well, but then you actually have to implement them. And... Um, this is all built on the need for better government, government, governance of how you manage cryptography within the organization in the same way that you may govern the way that you have software and the, govern the way that you may do security and access. Um, thinking about better ways of consuming cryptography, an awful lot of cryptography is hard-coded into environments. Um, and then, of course, it's about automation, because when you start to look at the amount of cryptography you might have in your environment, everything from the certificates that you use to secure websites through to um, the way that you might secure stuff on a tape library, um, you need to be able to automate that, because if you're going to be able to deploy multiple crypto algorithms as they, as they come out, you're going to need to be able to do that in a way that doesn't require a lot of manual effort along the way. So this is all about building agility in um, across all of these phases. So in terms of migrating to being quantum safe, the first thing you have to do is actually understand what data you have. You have to be able to classify it. You have to decide which data you need to think about when you're doing this. Um, you need to do an inventory. And the inventory isn't just about what data you have or what systems you have and where the crypto is. It's about the dependencies. It's about how data moves from one area to another. So it's like building, a, if you like, a crypto bill of materials of how your environment works. You then need to think about how you are going to be agile with your crypto. We've all seen vulnerabilities announced in our existing software. So this isn't just about being quantum safe, this is about how do you manage when the existing crypto libraries that you're using to do encryption are found to have a bug or found to have a vulnerability. So how do you update it when it's broken? How do you change it? Regulation might require that you use a particular type of crypto. That's probably going to happen a lot 
over the next few years as regulated industries move to compulsory quantum safe cryptography. But also, as new threats become aware, you may need to deploy new kinds of cryptography. You need to monitor when it's being used. You need to make sure that it's being used when it needs to be used. How many times have we seen people cracking data and that data is actually being stored in plain text and readable to the human eye? And lastly, you need to be able to decide when crypto, a particular crypto algorithm has reached end of life and you need to be able to retire it. And you need to be able to do all of this without a significant amount of work effort. And what that does is that gives you quantum safe. So here in IBM, um, we have um, developed a quantum safe methodology that we think helps clients prepare to go on their quantum safe journey. Um, and it's all about helping them inventory what they have, help them decide what needs to be done, and how to prioritize where they should focus first. And as I said, remember being crypto agile isn't just about deploying quantum safe algorithms, it's about being able to respond to um, threats as they come in and being able to deploy new capabilities as they become available. So let me leave you with three thoughts. The first thought is that while scalable, reliable, quantum computers might be some time off, the data that those computers can be used to hack is around today and can be stolen today. The second thing is that being agile with your ability to update and upgrade your cryptography is the key to remaining safe. And that's actually true whether you're thinking about quantum safe or just today safe. So what would I advise? I would advise everyone to start thinking about how to protect yourself against current and future data breaches and the ability in the future for bad actors to be able to get into the data and the digital certificates that you're using. Because I can guarantee somewhere in the world today there are bad actors stealing data and stealing certificates that they know that at some point in the future they will be able to get in and use for nefarious purposes. I hope that's been a useful session. Thank you for your time and have a great rest of the conference. Hello, I'm Adam Robinson from IBM and I'd like to talk to you about immutability. You've probably heard the word and it seems like everyone is talking about it at the minute. We talk about it a lot at IBM and I know when it comes to some of our competitors in the backup space, they also talk about it a lot. But what does it mean? Is it really so important or is it just another buzzword? Immutability is actually a really straightforward concept. It essentially means when something is written, it can't be deleted or altered. It's permanent. In a world where ransomware sneaks into your IT environment and remains undetected for many months before being activated, immutability can be a very powerful tool and definitely one that every enterprise infrastructure team should implement. You see, once that ransomware is in your environment, it spreads silently, far and wide. It will even be ingested into your backups. So when it's activated, it's going to cause maximum damage. It will start encrypting or even deleting your data everywhere, including your backup copies. Not all backup software provides true immutability, but with truly immutable backup copies, like you get with Spectrum Protect Suite, once they're written, they can't be changed or deleted. You will always be able to bring a copy back in its original state. It will always be there, whether you like it or not.
Thanks, Adam. That was an absolutely fantastic session. Uh, we're now going to move swiftly on and we're going to hear from a guy called Roger Noble um, from Noble Dynamics, who is a guru when it comes to big data and analytics and putting your data to work within your business. Um, so we're going to hear from Roger. He's going to talk to us about how we can use information within our businesses to help us defend against cybercrime. And this session is called Separating the Signal from the Noise. Roger, over to you. Well, hi, my name is uh, Roger Noble. I'm the director of uh, Noble Dynamics, and um, I'm a data consultant, and what I like to do is sort of help businesses and organizations really get good value out of their data, whether it be structured data, unstructured data, data of any sort, really. Um, something that I just really love and what gets me excited and passionate is about making the best use of data and, and helping people to better understand it and make better decisions, ultimately. And um, data is one of those things. It's, uh, it's funny in that it has so many broad applications. It's used in so many different places. And uh, what excites me about data is that it has applications in, in healthcare, where it can literally save lives, in entertainment, and a whole lot of other different uses. Um, but also, it has a, a downside. Um, it can also be used for uh, maleficent purposes and for um, you know, cyber attacks and, and cyber, cyber crime, which is something we'll get to in a second. Um, but clearly, um, uh, today I really want to talk about uh, how you can get the most out of your data and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the different data types that are out there and some of the data that you might have in your business uh, that we can start to make use of. So uh, in business and in your personal life, data is uh, really key to uh, making any kind of decisions. Uh, without good data, without data, um, you really struggle to make real sort of actionable decisions uh, with that. And you tend to sort of lean more onto the, the gut feel of things, um, which more often than not tends to be wrong. Um, which is why um, really over the last 20 years or so, businesses have seen huge amounts of change and drive towards digital transformation and uh, sort of really developing database platforms AI and API integrations, uh, integrating databases and systems so that they can make better decisions uh, with the data that they have and the data that they have within their organizations. And um, really though, most organizations, it comes down to uh, a balance, a balance between uh, innovation and investing in the future and cost control. And uh, really the, the secret uh, to that and to most successful businesses is to make the most of data. With data you can unlock new opportunities uh, to make the right decisions at the right time, to discover new customers, new segments, new product features. Um, I, I just love data, you can tell. Um, and, and data analytics is, is really the key to all of that. And really, if you think about your own business, there's so many bits of data spread out all over. There's so many different systems out there and a lot of these are probably familiar to you. You're probably using a lot of these in your business today, whether it's, uh, you know, Xero, you know, Office 365, uh, you know, IBM for backups. You know, all of these systems out there have data spread all over. Um, but the, the, and the shocking fact is that actually, um, you know, as much as 8% of all this data is, is used within a business. Um, and most of it tends to be sort of centered around, you know, finance or sales with your CRM data um, where that data is found and that's really where most businesses uh, tend to focus when they're looking at data strategy and making use of their data. And uh, while you can get quite a lot out of those sort of systems, uh, you know, it really leaves the, the remaining 92% untapped um, in all of these other systems out there. And, um, Really, it comes down to not having the right tools and not having the right uh, amount of uh, investment and time to really leverage all of those sources of data. Uh, so really, when you've got all these, these systems, when you've got this data sort of spread all out over the place, it very quickly becomes uh, costly and difficult to be able to pull all these different data sources together to really make use of them. And um, that's why there's such an explosion of growth in the moment 
in uh, different tooling platforms, different systems, different big data analytics to be able to help you sort of pull all these data sources together to make the most of it. Um, but unfortunately, the, the real barrier to entry here is cost and, and time. Uh, many businesses lack the resources and the power of um, you know, Fortune 500 companies to be able to leverage uh, this data. And so ultimately that's sort of where a lot of these sort of uh, digital transformation type projects fall short. But as, uh, as Morpheus says, uh, what if I told you there was another way? Uh, my business has actually been working with Predator for over the past year now, and we've been doing quite a lot uh, with their data and helping them to get the most of it, especially in the realms of uh, anomaly detection and trying to identify uh, different types of cyber attacks. And some of what I've, I've been working on with them is what I'd like to talk to today. Um, and what might be interesting uh, to know is that actually uh, almost all of you in the audience here actually has a data lake, but you might not realize it. Um, actually, if you think about it, your backups are a data lake. You know, your, your backups um, come from combined sort of data from multiple systems, from, from databases, from online platforms, from your on-prem data, and, and, and other hybrid platforms all into a, a central place. And if you think about it, I mean, that is a, a data lake. And it represents a, a unique opportunity uh, to really sort of tap in to that data that's available uh, in that, that backup. Um, for example, if you're using IBM's backup solution, you already have a lot of this in place now. Um, but the question is, how do you make use of it? Um, so what I'd like to explore today is just one application uh, of that data uh, and sort of delve into a little bit more detail about just one use case where that applies. Um, so when you look at the, the market leaders in this space today, in the, in, the, in the backup space, they're all offering some sort of anomaly detection. Um, but the, the problem with a lot of these is that um, they only go so far. They give you a lot of information. Um, they sort of like to flag up a lot of anomalies, but what they often fail on is um, helping you to navigate and work with uh, the vast amount of false positives that, that tend to come up. Um, you know, a lot of the time, uh, if you're getting flagged for things that just aren't an issue, uh, you get to a point pretty quickly where you just turn it off. It's just too much you don't have the time to sift through it all. And so uh, today we're going to look through uh, one method where you can actually use AI and, and machine learning techniques to uh, address this problem and create a better anomaly detection system. So uh, to start with, to sort of explain uh, how all this works, I just wanted to start with one uh, type of data point that you might have with your backups. And that's uh, looking at um, um, the data and the size of the data that sort of that you are backing up on a regular basis. Uh, when it comes to backups, typically uh, you're not backing up an entire database uh, every time or in one in one go. What you end up doing is uh, backing up small diffs or small bits of information at once, which is sort of the difference between uh, today versus yesterday. You know, what are the bits that have changed? And then you're just backing up those, those smaller parts. Uh, that way you're not um, sending you know, terabytes of information to your backup daily. And um, it helps to keep you know, bandwidth and other costs down. And it's that little bit of data that gets sent over. Um, it, looks, it could look different or it can change over time. But if you look at it uh, as a whole, it can actually represent a unique, almost like a fingerprint of that particular device or server um, or platform that actually you can train machine learning models to identify uh, and then figure out a, a typical behavior or a typical pattern that happens with that machine. Um, one thing though and one downside to that is that it really is, is data dependent. Uh, these systems and, and AI in general uh, only is as good as the data that you feed into these systems and if you don't have enough information it can fail to really capture and understand that fingerprint that we're talking about really well. Uh, 
So, I mean, a simple example is perhaps you've got a system that is only used infrequently, maybe at the end of the month. If you only have two weeks of data, it's very difficult for it to tell um, that, you know, when it gets busy at the end of the month, that that's uh, not an anomaly because it just doesn't have enough historical information to go on. And so having uh, enough data to be able to train these models is really key to be able to better understand and then start to think about how we can use that data to predict uh, future behaviour for anomaly detection. So um, what we can do is once we have all of that data, um, it makes it easier to put together that, that fingerprint to find those behaviours and then when looking forward, it can sort of, based on past um, history, you know, based on past actions or those bits that are moving on, it can have a, a guess as to what the future might look like. And this is where it gets really interesting actually because we can then use that guess and, and compare it with the real world to see is this an anomaly or not. If we see something coming along um, where it's sort of jumping way outside of what it was predicting it should see uh, from, that, from that backup, then that's something that we can flag and say, look, this, is, this isn't right. We were expecting this, but what we're seeing is that. Um, which is great. I mean, this is sort of the beginnings of an anomaly detection system. Um, the, the trick here and the real art behind all of this, though, is, is still really deciding upon what is a true anomaly, a, 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 a no, uh, anomaly <laughs> and what's a false positive. Um, you wouldn't want this going off every time there was a 0.01% difference between, uh, you know, what you're seeing in your prediction. Uh, there is an art to sort of tweaking this and saying, look, this is sort of the threshold um, where I think this is a true anomaly. And the other thing that we can do, though, is then start to introduce additional sources of data. Um, all of these just help to really dramatically improve the accuracy of our models. Uh, and to increase our chances that we are detecting true anomalies. So we've already got our line in the middle for data transferred, but we could add to that, you know, the duration of the backup, how long it took. We could add the dedupe ratio, for example, and just with these three data points, we can get orders of magnitude more accuracy so that all of these things in, um, in concert together um, show that there, there is an anomaly we, we can be pretty confident that we're on the, on the right track here, that this is something completely unexpected. Just a, another example here uh, between two different types of anomalies. Um, we're seeing these are sort of two examples here where at the top we've got our predicted behaviour and then below is our actual behaviour. And you can sort of see um, on anomaly A, there's a sort of a slight difference. Um, you know, the data changed a few extra points um, it took, you know, an extra hour. And so is this a true anomaly? Uh, looking at anomaly B, you can see actually that there's a, been a significant change. It's changed, uh, uh, you know, 50% change. Um, backups times took a lot longer. And, and you wouldn't want these two anomalies, although they are, you know, they may be anomalies, um, you wouldn't want these to be treated differently. Um, you definitely want anomaly B to be sort of a much higher priority or a different level of alert. This should be a 10 or 11 instead of a 2 or a 3 out of 10. Um, and so the other thing to look at is, you know, how do you kind of rank or how do you sort of highlight and, and say that this is a high priority anomaly versus a low priority anomaly? And something that's really important when designing these systems to, to really uh, come up with that definition um, for these. Uh, the final thing and the, one of the most important uh, to really start to build a value out of these systems is to have a, what's known as a feedback loop. And I want to just sort of try to explain that with a, a bit of a simpler example, something completely different. Um, say we're trying to uh, develop a system for uh, finding cats in photos. And so uh, whenever you develop these types of systems, uh, typically what you do is you get loads of pictures of cats and you draw boxes around them and say that's a cat and that's a cat and that's a cat and you feed them into a model and train it and then over time it learns what a cat looks like. Uh, however, you might introduce a new animal and it will get confused. If it's never seen a dog before, it might try and think that that's a cat also. Uh, 
Um, and what's critical here is that um, you need to um, be kind of along the way telling it that this new data point, this new animal, is not a cat, it's actually a dog. And, and by giving it that feedback, uh, what it does is it helps to improve the model. Because models change over time. Um, they can degrade with age. As new uh, points of data come in, as the world changes around these models, um, they can lose uh, accuracy over time. And so being able to have a constant feedback loop is critical to make, making sure um, that your models stay relevant. And this is especially important uh, when it comes to cybercrime. It's, it's like a constantly moving target. And so to sort of show you this, um, you've got these sort of multiple stages when it comes to your models. Um, first, you've got your AI. It sort of predicts a certain behavior. Uh, it then compares that against the real world and uh, potentially flags uh, an anomaly. Um, the feedback then comes in is that we can actually test uh, a lot of these anomalies um, when it comes to backups because if there's a known attack vector, if there's a, you know, some sort of a, a ransomware that's on a system, we can actually scan it and, and identify and see if it's really there or not. And then this becomes you know, the perfect kind of feedback to the system. We can then put that into the model and then let it learn from that. So when it sees these anomalies in the future, it knows from real world data that this is a true anomaly. So where does this leave us? I just wanted to sort of summarize uh, you know, what we talked about today and a few points. Uh, the first is that um, actually a lot of us have a data lake and a lot of um, data in one place that we can access today already. Um, and what's key is that how can we start to put that, you know, that real gold mine of data to good work. Uh, secondly, um, include as many data points as possible when doing any kind of AI or any kind of data analytics. Uh, you don't want to be reliant on one source. It's by combining all these together that you start to get true value out of your data. Uh, thirdly, uh, not all anomalies are alike. Um, just because it's an anomaly, maybe it's one that you're able to let slide. Others are way more important and you need to be out of a measure and really understand what a good and high quality high severity anomaly looks like compared to a low severity anomaly. Uh, and finally is having that feedback loop. Um, it's critical that you are constantly um, keeping that human or that test in the loop so that you can use that to con constantly refine, remove biases from your AI um, and improve them over time. Uh, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your time uh, today and also just want to say thanks to Predator and IBM for, for having me. Cheers, thanks. Hello, I'm Josh Lewis from IBM. Do you remember when Tom Cruise was lowered from the ceiling of a CIA vault in the 1996 Mission Impossible movie? I don't. How old do you think I am? Apparently it's a great scene and it's a really good way to explain the concept from the air gap. So let's take a look at the iconic movie scene now. Josh, we can't show it, mate. It's legal copyright stuff. So what are we going to do? You're the TikTok superstar. You work it out. I've got this. So here's a question for you. Why didn't Tom Cruise and his mates hack into the CIA computer remotely? It would be a boring movie, but it would be much less hassle. It's because the computer wasn't connected to a network, and that's an air gap. It's when a device is isolated from any other device or network. Way back in the 90s, when data needed a physical connection to be transferred, the term air gap made sense. Literally having a clear air between your device and a network meant that it couldn't be accessed. Fast forward 30 years and the principle still exists. But today, there's different ways to achieve it. One of the most popular ways to achieve an air gap is a logical air gap where the use of logical processes such as encryption and role-based access make a storage device inaccessible to unauthorized people. And the most popular way to achieve a logical air gap is with cloud object storage, which you can get from IBM Cloud. Of course, the ultimate device for creating a true air gap for your backups is tape. A tape library provides a true physical air gap. 
Believe it or not, tape has a role to play in your ultimate cyber resilient backup. Even I have to admit it. Sometimes you can't beat the oldies. Thank <laughs> you.